Good morning, church. Would you stand with us and worship together this morning? The book of Psalms says, Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? And that's what we're proclaiming this morning. Who is like him? No one is like him because he has done such great things. Let's sing to him together. Come, let us worship our King. This morning we come to worship a God whose faithfulness and promises all find their display, their yes in King Jesus. And so we come and we respond to him this morning. We sing, there's a promise. There's a promise. It's a person. He's a savior. Call him my name. He's faithful to the faith. righteous he is gracious he is jesus all we can say is you are you are holy 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 and you are worthy 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 and you are high and lifted up you are peace it's enough you are glory 
today singing those same songs about his holiness, his worthiness, his, his glory is worth celebrating. And we also join the angels today in celebrating the fact that we have gained a person in our family, a brother in Christ who has decided to follow Jesus by confessing him as Lord and Savior and walking with him forever. So will you join us in that celebration today? Good morning. My name is Peter Buckland. I'm one of the elders here at the church, and I'd like to welcome you to our time of worship and praise today. Uh, just by way of reminder, our early childhood and children's ministries are up and running and able to receive your children to learn about Jesus on a level that they can understand and to partner with you as parents to help them to be disciples of Jesus in a way that makes sense to them. I'm also happy to announce that next Sunday we'll begin our adult Sunday school offerings. You'll notice on the chairs right in front of you that there is an orange card that has a code on it. If you take your camera on your phone and place it over that co code, it will take you to cco.church slash classes where you can go ahead and take a look at all of the offerings that we will have and you can sign up uh, right there on the web for whatever you'd like to take that we're offering. And if you want to do that during the week, then just go to cco.church slash classes. You'll find the same information. Uh, today, Mark is continuing on in our uh, series in 1 Corinthians on the cruciform life. And today he's going to be talking about how everything that we do is a part of our work and especially what we do for a paycheck uh, can be done for the glory of God. And if you are in a situation where work is difficult for you, we hope that this message will be instructional as well as inspirational for you today. Right now, would you please join our creative arts team as we continue singing praises to God. One of the things I love about this church is we are a singing church. And so today I invite you to continue to lift up to our God all that he is as we acknowledge the fact that he has shown himself in the person and work of Jesus and allowed us to glorify and worship him today. We sing Jesus the man, Jesus the great I am. Jesus the man.
sing of a shared story in which Christ is the King. We sing. I was dead from the start, stone of my heart. The enemy gave, I believed, and I start. Guilty and broken, damaged and scarred. The image of beauty distorted and marred. But Christ came for the guilty. But Christ crushed him instead Disarming the rulers Raising the dead The kingdom of God Hath paraded And, and this morning A witness I got rain to breathe His image is seen In Jesus the King Above it all Jesus I got the privilege yesterday of being able to officiate and do a wedding. And uh, one of the, the best parts about doing a wedding, and also sometimes the scariest, is when families come together. And, but what, becomes, what makes it most special is that these two individuals are joining lives. And so whatever frustrations or anxiety or stress may come within those moments of preparing to, to exchange vows and promises, there's very little that is going to disrupt the fact that two people are going to become one. And one of the things we do in marriage is we exchange rings, right? And we have these rings, and what's funny is that these are kind of old-fashioned in many ways. You know, our culture, our, they, what they tell us is, is things just have to be utilitarian. They have to be useful for them to be worth something. But yet we still use these things. You know why? Because sometimes an object isn't about how useful it is. Sometimes it's just about how meaningful it is. Sometimes it's about what stands behind it. And so we use rings like this and we give them to our spouse and we start to describe them in light of what they represent. A love just like a circle that is endless. And as our love is endless, we give these rings as a reminder that that's what it should be. We're reminded of the expense, the cost, because sometimes love costs us. And yet we give this to our spouse as a reminder that those things are worth enduring. It reminds us of the precious metal that it's made out of, its purity, what all that means. Because when love is given, it should be done so in purity and meaning. And we give this to our spouse as a reminder of what all that entails, a helpful thing. And we come today and sitting at Jesus' table to remember that we're not just doing this because it's useful, but because it's meaningful. You see the bread and the cup, they become for us symbols that say far more than we could ever capture in a sentence. They say far more. And Jesus describes it like this in Matthew. He says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. 
Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, these tiny little objects become so meaningful because they remind us of the great cost, the great sacrifice, the great love that our King Jesus showed for us in his death and resurrection. More than that, they become an invitation, a profession, a confession as we proclaim once more as the body of Christ that we sit at this table, not because anything that we offer to God, but simply because he offered something to us. What an incredible grace, an incredible love. And instead of of simply being sobered by the moment, we also celebrate the fact that this death and resurrection that our King Jesus endured is offered to us that when we take part in these small little symbols, they would remind us that we've been called to something meaningful, to become something meaningful. They remind us of forgiveness and reconciliation and change that can take place, not just in our lives, but in every single relationship that we've ever had, that redemption is possible, forgiveness is possible. And lastly, they remind us that there will be a day that completely rips away every sickness, sadness, mourning, death, when a new eternal life will be offered and we will join a banquet that will be with our King. You see, this is a rehearsal meal, but the true event is coming. And we hold on to these emblems, we hold on to these symbols, and we take them each week to remind ourselves that our work is not done yet. Let me pray. Father God, you are holy and true. You are good and faithful. And we sit at this table acknowledging the fact that we are in need, but also celebrating the fact that you have offered all that we need. And so, Father, we pray that today would simply be a response to who you are, your glory, your might, your grace. And it's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Let's allow scripture to take our thoughts captive as we reflect and respond to the word of God. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33. Good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you just keep that available, I want to kind of walk through the text today and have you see it in, in your Bibles or your apps as well as on the screens behind me. If you're visiting Christ Church today, we're really glad you're here. We're in a series, as Peter mentioned at the very beginning, called The Cruciform Life. And we're trying to look at the themes that Paul talked to a church in a town called Corinth that is just like America. 
multicultural, a lot of different philosophies and themes, people doing business in this city, engaging in and out, learning from other people, their style of worship, and so forth. And so Paul is having this engagement with these group of people about principles of faith and how the cross and the man who went to the cross shapes all of us. And if we either open ourselves to it or reject it, but it can shape our lives in the way we think, what we do, and what we become. And that's what we've been focusing on, the greater themes of this book. And uh, we're in chapter 10. And if you read the complexity of chapter 10, you may see, well, he's not talking about this, this, or this. He went right to the end of the chapter. And the reason is, what Paul talks about in the beginning of chapter 10 has already been covered by him from chapter six through chapters nine. He talked about our freedom. When do we limit our freedom in Christ for the benefit of others? And when do we fully experience our freedom in Christ to the benefit of others? How do we do that balance? How do we stay unified? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in the basic decisions we make each and every day of our existence? In fact, the last verse that was read there at the end of the chapter is, not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. Paul is challenging all of us to see what we do not only in the big epic moments, but in the daily grind. What are we doing that is showing the world the goodness of Jesus and the power of the gospel? So I wanna focus on a theme, pardon my expression, but it's not very sexy. In fact, I've come to conclude that looking at this message of all of them, I knew I needed to preach it, but I wasn't really excited about it. And I thought, isn't that funny that in the message that I'm telling us that sometimes serving God happens in the daily grind, that this sermon will be a grind. So you can forgive me in advance. I've just justified my entire existence. So let's look at verse 31 of this chapter one more time. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is a summary statement of everything Paul has been talking about to date. Remember the eating and drinking? Would you eat and drink in such a way that it would cause someone who's trying to find Jesus to be discouraged and quit? So Paul is bringing this all together. He says, no matter what you do, it needs to be done, whether it's Big or little, powerful or subtle, do what you do to the glory of God. So how are we gonna do what we do all day long to the glory of God? I have a concern that many of us have parceled our lives out or departmentalized them into, I have a work life, I have a church life, I have a family life. Uh, The truth is, no, you have one life and all of those things encompass who you are and what you become. I I read this week in a research article that uh, counting the time of getting ready for work commuting to and from work and processing your work at night and doing your work during the day that the average American will spend 80,000 hours of their life at work in some fashion or form. About a third of our lives will be spent on this. So I wanna challenge all of us to not see our work life as independent of our worship life, to realize those are 80,000 hours that can be turned into something that's better and good for God and good for you and ultimately good for those around us. So how do we spend these 80,000 hours of our life? Now I know that there'll be people online, people that have joined with us here this morning who are retired, so, and we say, lucky you. But I'll tell you the truth, most retired people I know are busier than I am. The good thing about being retired, I'm told, is you get to choose how you spend your hours. When you're in the work field, you're told what to do with your hours. But at the end of the day, And retirement is a concept that's American, not necessarily biblical, that all of us are called until our dying days to have a purpose to our life and a reason. As I pastor and I meet people that are in retirement homes or they're they're inferred in their their rooms and they're, they're at the hospitals and I see people that are aging and they can't do all that they used to do, there's a common expression and it's not, man, I hated how much I worked. Most of the conversations I have with people are, I I wanna know why I'm still here. I wanna know what I can still do. I wanna know what difference I can make. You see, we're wired by God for this. And so I wanna talk to you about the the lens I'm looking at this entire series in. For me, one of the ways I can see the gospel in the Bible is to look at it through four lenses. The first lens is what is the character of God? What is the purpose of God in this? Then how does the sinfulness of man, how does that affect what God desired? And how did Jesus bridge the gap And ultimately then, why should I live in my faith because of this? What do I learn about God, myself, what Jesus provides me, and then how I'm to live differently because of those truths? And I'd like to use those lenses this morning to walk us through, whether you're paid or unpaid, it does not matter. This is not a preacher's story like you create a straw man and knock him over. 
I actually had a conversation with a woman in Michigan who's one of the best moms I ever met, and she said to me, well, I don't really have a job. I'm just a stay-at-home mom, and I corrected her in a heartbeat. You have the greatest job in the world. Let's not confuse being paid with our opportunities because sometimes the unpaid jobs make the greatest difference. And so in light of all of that, let's talk about the character of God, and I want you to know that God delights in work. I know this from chapters one and two of the book of Genesis. In fact, if you wanna know that any theology is founded on the first 11 chapters of that book, all we know about God, about purpose, about man, about sin, about God's remedy for sin, all of those epic pillars of our theology come from the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and we learn our theology of work and purpose from Genesis one and two. God delights in his work. How do I know that? Because when God was done creating the entire world, do you remember what he called, called it? He said it's good. He found delight in it. It needed done, it was done well, it was done the way he wanted. It had a purpose and a reason behind it and he celebrated it. And when God created the world, he just didn't create it and spin it and say, well, good luck. He actually has been involved in it. God works in it, God works through it, God works for it. He sustains, he creates, he gives life, he's done all of this and God delights in work. It's not just something for us to do, some way for us to spend our time. Remember that work was a good thing, it was never a punishment. It was never uh, something that God used to make our lives harder. It was before sin entered the world. It was perfect in the Garden of Eden. And I believe 100% that when God establishes the new heaven and the new earth, we will work. We will work and it will not be the tiresome, toilsome work we do now. It will be exactly what it was back then because God designed our work. Genesis 2.15 The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. See, there's a purpose behind it. We're different than all other creation. We're made in the image of God, but not only are we made in the image of God, we are given some of the work of God, if you will, that God wants us to work with him to put the world in subjection to him, that we are partners with God in the work. We contribute, not anything that God couldn't contribute, but we contribute something that's a gift. It's a declaration. It's a testimony. It's a tribute to God. And we do all of this. We were doing this before sin entered the world. We can continue to do it while sin is in the world. And we will continue even more so to do it when sin has been removed from the world. But I also want you to see that there's a rhythm to work. Not only is work a blessing, but it gives us purpose and a reason. But there's also a rhythm to it. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but I want you to notice that God, when he put work into his creation, there was a rhythm to it. Six days of work, one day of rest. Now, we have conflated that with unions and everything else about how many hours a person can work and so forth, but normally it's work until the work is done and take one day of the week to rest, and not only to rest, but to rest in the God, to rest in the Lord, to trust him in all of this. When we get that rhythm out of play, we're messing with something that's good for us and turning into something that could be detrimental. Timothy Keller, in a book called Every Good Endeavor, his theology of work, He says something, I'm just gonna pick bits and pieces of it that I found fascinating. He said, work is one of the few things in life that significant doses of do not harm us. In other words, hard work never killed any of us. And he says, but the Bible also doesn't say that one day to work and six days to rest, nor does it say that work and rest should be balanced evenly, that you should work three and a half days and rest three and a half days. He said, in fact, Leisure and pleasure are good, but we can only take so much of each. We like to test that, though, don't we? And he said, if you talk to people that are kept away from a purpose every day, they become sad, they become depressed, and they begin to wonder why. You see, God designed work by his grace. And God designed work for our good. And then the one piece that I want us to focus on today, ultimately, God defined our work for his glory. And when our work is by his grace and for his good, but not for his glory, then we will see how we have broken what was intended to be good. See, Paul talks about work almost as much as any other subject matter, if you will. Because when he wrote to the churches in Ephesus, there was a section on how we should work. When he wrote to the people of Colossae in your Colossian letter, how should you work? When he wrote to the churches in Rome, there's a section how should you work? When he wrote to the people of Thessalonica, 
how should you work? When he wrote to two young preachers, Timothy and Titus, there's a section, how should you work? When Peter wrote to the early church under persecution in First and Second Peter, there was a section, how do you testify to God by the way you work? You see, I know this is not gonna be a message that you're gonna be excited to tell people you heard, but I bet you your bosses and your coworkers would love if you heard it. Because God does something in our work that he doesn't do anyplace else. And it's a good thing. It's the gospel at work. It's the character of God displayed. So in Colossians chapter three, another church that Paul wrote to, he said, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You are serving the Lord Christ. If we see our work as more than just a means to an end, if we see our work as more than making money to pay our bills, because truthfully, and I don't want to deny this, one of the reasons we work is to provide for us. Now, back, back a long, long time ago, when civilization was just being created, you had to do it all. You had to raise the animals. You had to raise the food. You had to take care of the property. You had to build your home. And now we're more parceled out. We have people that build homes and people that raise food for us and people that have large ranches that they raise a bunch of food for everybody. But the work still needs to be done. And it's part of the way God created us to have a purpose to wake up with each and every day. Because in the garden, there was joy in the work. There was no mindless, meaningless work. There was no futile or frustrating work. They worked with God. And the work came from God, and the work was for God. But then we have this concept of the sinfulness of man. And this is where our sinfulness and rebellion has ruined some things. Now, not meaning like that they're, they're worthless, but it has taken some of the worth from them by the way we treat them. See, work is a mark of human dignity. Unlike any other part of creation, we were created to work with God. Everything else was given as a gift of God to make creation work, but we're the ones that work with God to rule. So when you see work as a necessary evil, you're partially true. But we as believers shouldn't stay in that capacity. We should find the purpose of our work. And I'm not suggesting that you walk out here going, well, I hate my job and I'm gonna go find something better. That may be the solution to this, but it's not always the solution to this. Sometimes the purpose God has in store for you is right in the midst of your mundane it really is how you view it and how you respond to it. See, we realize that Genesis 1 and 2 reveals the glory of man made in the image of God. We can learn something about ourselves and what is intended that we may have forgotten or lost. In chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26, it says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. And in verse 28, God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful Increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. There's some key words there. Rule, produce, fill, subdue. And if you pay attention to those words, those are actually the things that God did in creation. Those are the things that God does all the time. And he's inviting us into this story of work where our work can, we can help him rule. We can fulfill purposes. We can produce fruit. We can subdue the world. I know this is a strange illustration, so give me just a little bit of grace and some patience. I'm gonna try to explain how weird I am, and I'm hoping one or two of you understand it and agree. So I'm gonna take this shot, because I think it's gonna to correlate to every single one of us. There is something in the way God wired you and me that when we can bring order out of chaos, we are most satisfied. That there's just something about taking what could be and bringing it about that gives us a sense of purpose. I tend to believe that's because God made us this way. Now, mine is stranger than others. When I'm in my yard and I cut my lawn and I trim my bushes and I push the woods back and I burn the burn pile and all the leaves are off my driveway and my lawn, my tail wags a thousand miles an hour. Now, some of you are like, what a waste of time. Judge all you want. All I'm telling you is, when I can bring order out of chaos, I feel like God. Not the God, but I feel like I think this is what I'm made for. When I take our junk drawer in our kitchen and I get rid of all the stuff that only God knows how it got there. Why do we have 72 half-sharpened pencils? I don't know. Nobody uses a pencil ever. Why do we have nine keys that don't go in any doors? I don't know. So when my wife leaves the house, I throw them all away. And you know what? No one's missed any of it. I like to organize our cabinets. I like things in their proper place. Now, some of you are going, you're really, really weird. No, no, I'm like God. I'm bringing order out of chaos. Now, for some of you, it's a different form and fashion. Some of you like take the disorder and chaos of a child. 
And you like to raise them up and teach them manners and teach them grace and teach them beauty and teach them joy and your tail wags. Amen, anyone? Yeah, you see, there's moments where we feel like, and I'm gonna use a weird word, we're contributing to the way it ought to be. We're making sense of what shouldn't make sense. We're bringing it in and we're bringing it back to something deep inside of us. It just says, I'm here to do that. And my grandfather told me a lifetime ago, when you find out what you're here for, you'll never work a day the rest of your life. It's just who you are and what you're meant to do. Now, for some of us in the room, you're like, dude, I am 100% doing what I should be doing. Thank God for that. Honestly, thank God for that privilege. And for some of you who are like, nope, right now, I'm just doing what I have to do because I got furloughed or I got laid off or I just need to pay my bills and life is hard right now, I understand that's a season in your life, but even in the midst of that, there is a purpose to be found in what you're doing that can bring order out of chaos and most of all, it can bring glory to God. It may be bring glory to God publicly or it may just bring glory to God privately. Find what that is because in our sinfulness, we may have lost that. Our work is a creative expression. God created us to create and to fix, to build and construct, to serve and provide, to organize and improve. And whatever your thing is, when you're doing one of those, fixing or improving, providing or serving, you're finding out why you're here. And waking up on a Monday isn't nearly as bad when you know why you got up on a Monday. When you get up on a Monday and you don't think anything's gonna be any different, then pray that God might help you find a purpose that brings him glory because in finding God's glory, you and I will find our reason. It's how all of us contribute. And it may be different than it was. I, I read a lot of history because I'm fascinated by it. In the 16th and 17th century, you survived by what your estate could produce. If there was a drought or a famine and your land didn't produce enough food, your family starved and you died. We live in a more interdependent culture today. I don't know if it's good or bad, it just is. It is what it is. And so we all noticed, right, when non-essential businesses were identified and they shut down, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, all businesses are essential now and everybody comes back, you can still feel the repercussions when everybody doesn't contribute, don't you? There were some factories that were shut down for six to 12 weeks, and now they're producing again, but we're all waiting for what, they, what we rely on them to produce. You see, all of us contribute, but we're called as believers to contribute beyond just the general welfare of our humanity. We're to contribute to the glory of God. And we can do that by contributing to the general welfare of our community and the people around us. You see, when you realize all that God is doing, it allows us to have some freedom. And the freedom is, my contribution to the general welfare of my fellow citizen and to the glory of God does not have to be appraised by the world. There are many who sit here today thinking, my job doesn't give me much dignity, I don't have a title, I, I feel like I'm not being used very well, and all of those things may be true, but I want you to understand the human dignity found in work is not how the world sees it, it's how God sees it. It's about you and I contributing and sacrificing for something bigger than ourselves. And when sin comes into the world, our work has been disfigured by the disobedience of man. That's why work became harder. That's why we suffer more frustration. That's why some weeks you get three Mondays rather than one. And you're like, ugh. Oh. And then some weeks you get two Fridays and you're thankful. Right? In the midst of all of this, it's finding our purpose and fulfilling our purpose, but our purpose cannot be found outside of the glory of God because in the glory of God we find who we are. We find the best. In Genesis 3, verse 17, to Adam God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree from which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So yesterday was my day off, and it was my therapy day. I went out on my lawn, I was all happy. I went for my walk, I came back, I put on my headphones, I turned on Pandora, and I went to work. My favorite work. Got my mower out, my weed eater out, my leaf blower out, and I was going to town. I was feeling good, like I'm doing something that I could measure, something that's done, I can see it. And then I saw him, a huge snake in my yard. So I tried to do what every coward would do. I just dropped the deck of my mower down 
further, thinking I would just slice and dice him, but he was too quick. So then I had to run back and get a shovel, and I took his head off with one mighty blow. You're welcome. And anyway, I threw his head one direction and his body the other direction in the woods and went back to work, and I was so, I was shaking. That thing was massive. I, I remember it as, as thick as my leg. I'm not sure it actually was, but I was frightened. And when it was all done, I thought, oh my gosh, I just lived out the gospel because this is how preachers think. <laughs> I was so proud of myself. But in the midst of all of that, and looking at my text for this morning, I thought, isn't that funny that in the perfect garden, there were no such things that would get in our way and frighten us and confuse us. And I looked at all the weeds in my yard, and I looked at all the briars in the woods that I want to cut out, but I know it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to hurt. You see, when we mess up God's plan, things come into our lives that we don't want there. Yet we still have to deal with them. And what the world and culture and our selfishness tells us is that we don't want to work hard because it's just too much, it's just too futile, nothing actually happens, and God's like, no, trust my work. Trust that you're being shaped by your efforts, by your commitment, by your sacrifices. That in every kind of work, in the church, in business, in medicine, at schools, and even in our homes, it's a lot of hard work to produce some tiny little pieces of fruit. But we're here for this to rule, to subdue, to produce, to fulfill, to live this out. And the distortion of our work is real, but the purposes behind our work have not changed. And how do we distort work? Well, there's only one of two ways to take what God has given us and use it indifferently or to ruin it. The first is to overvalue work. And this is where work becomes our idol. This is where our title and our benefits and our pay packages where we're not just working to feed our family, which is a noble effort to provide food, shelter, and security for for our people, for our tribe. This is what God asked us to do. It's in Scripture. This is why we're here, to care for one another and to provide. And if we have a little bit extra, to share with those who don't. But when our work becomes our idol, it becomes our meaning, our joy, and our identity. When it becomes our primary passion, what we spend all of our time thinking about, deliberating on, when our energy and devotion, sometimes to the exclusion of our family, sometimes to the exclusion of the church, when it becomes that my job is more important than my spiritual walk and the development of those around me, we have overvalued work and we've put it in a position to be what it was never and can never be. The opposite extreme of that is to undervalue work, to feel like you don't need to work, that others should care for you, that everyone should meet your needs because you're equal to them. And there's the opposite of that. The Bible crystal clear says this, if a man or woman shouldn't work, neither should they eat. We all contribute, interdependent. But we as a church, we not only contribute to be interdependent of society, we get to contribute in such a way that the world sees something different in what we're doing. And the reason we do what we do, and the reason we make what we make, and the reason we accomplish what we accomplish is far more than paying our bills. It's actually attributing glory to God and thanking him for our talents, our abilities, and our opportunities. So the sufficiency of Jesus. Here's where I'm afraid it's going to be a little comical for you because you may think I'm stretching the soup a little thin, but I wanna show you how what Jesus does on the cross shapes the way we work. First of all, Christ's work has secured our salvation. Let there be no doubt. The work of the cross was to secure our salvation, to do the work, to provide the atoning blood, but it frees us to rest in his work as the superior work. What I mean by that is this. Simplest illustration I can come up with is there will be some people who awkwardly feel like what I do is more important than what they do to God. They'll say that he's a preacher, and so what he's doing is more important than me sweeping a floor or watching children or doing something like that, and I wanna tell you openly you're wrong. Here's why. Because my work does not make God love me more, and your work does not make God love you less. Your work can be a tribute to him, can be a proclamation of the goodness of the gospel, All of this is available to you, and it's available to me. And it doesn't matter, as long as it's legal and ethical, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is why you're doing it. And what is your contribution to the kingdom of heaven through what you do? We are justified by faith alone in Jesus, not by our profession, not by the applause of men, not by our titles or how much money we make. So we can all rest in our work as a tribute to God, not based on a superiority or in superiority compared to someone else. 
Second of all, Christ's work has secured our satisfaction. It frees us from idolizing our work, and it frees us from having idleness of work. That we work because God's asked us to. We work for his glory and his purposes because God is worthy of it. We don't serve just for the applause of men. In fact, we're, we're talked about, we talk about this quite often. We will have frustration and determination. We will have things that have to happen in our lives, but the truth is we bring God a gift. Silly story again, but when, I'm one of four boys, if you don't know, and we fought every now and then. And sometimes those fights would get really physical. I mean, just for a moment. There'd be punches thrown and somebody won, somebody lost. And at the end of it, my parents had this ridiculous concept. When they would cut us, catch us fighting, they would make us tell each other we loved each other. I didn't. That's the reason I was hitting him. There was no love. It was stupid. But they would have this moment, and they would hold us together, and we'd have to say something, and they'd say, I love you, I love you too. And none of us meant it. It was wasted words. But later, when we'd reasoned why we fought, they would come in the bedroom, and we would be playing together. And my mom never understood that. My dad's like, ah, just dudes. But they would make us after the fight, when time had passed and we realized how stupid that was, we would say, tell your brother something. I love you. I love you too. It meant more then than it did at first. Now, you may say in my work, I can't think of a way I can honor God. Yes, you can. It may be initially hard, and you may think, I don't even mean this, but if you take some time thinking through it, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to awaken you to the value of your work and the contribution you can make. And then your work becomes alive, and it'll make a difference. The necessity of faith, you and I are free by God to worship God in our work. And not only to worship God in our work, but to show others how they can find worship in work too. Once again, Colossians chapter three, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. We're to work honorably. We're to work humbly. And we're even to work eagerly. And if you can't right now see how you can work honorably, or work humbly, or work eagerly, spend some time this morning talking to God about it, because I believe it's God's will for you, and not against your will. I believe God shapes our will by the goodness of the cross, that he can give you the want to, knowing what you need to, that he can bring this together in all of us. You see, how we approach our work is the way we adorn the gospel. That's why Paul talks about it to almost every church he writes a letter. He wants them to say, don't just profess it. Remember we talked last week, there's a difference between being for Jesus and being with Jesus. There's a difference in believing Jesus should be praised and actually living your life to praise him. And this is where work is the daily grind. It's not the big stage. It's not the fancy moment. It's not the grand proclamation. It's the everyday proof that the gospel has altered us. That's why when Paul wrote a preacher named Titus, he said these words, teach slaves it's easy to translate slaves here to servants, and I don't mean against their will, but people who joined a partnership with a landowner to work for them on their estate to have their needs met. Teach servants to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teachings about God our Savior attractive. I want you to notice that last verse. So they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. This is why Paul repeatedly called Christians shaped by the cross to live their lives of sacrifice, serving the greater purpose of work so that the world can see what someone who understands the goodness of our God, how they live their lives. In the 80,000 hours you will invest in your occupational pursuits, and in your retirement and beyond, work in every way that will make the teachings of God our Savior attractive. We work to adorn the gospel and the one who brought it to us. Let's stand together.
come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and there's no more. We sing it, we celebrate. Come on. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Oh, for God, for God to love the world that he gave us. is one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in me will live forever. and resurrection and yet it's still continuing because so many people don't quite know that yet but today we get to celebrate we have been doing this throughout the month of September looking at our ministry right here right now celebrating the fact that it's been 10 years that we've been doing these things meeting the needs of those within our community financially physically and this morning what we want to do is allow you to see a story who's been impacted by the work this ministry has done so if you would just take a seat for a moment and check out this video I graduated high school um, I went to college in Arkansas for a year and then after that I got married really young um, and we started a family and my then husband joined the military so he was in the army and got moved around a lot got deployed um, we lived that life for 12 years as a military family um, and then whenever we were he was getting redeployed to Iraq for a second time. He decided to leave. And so the kids and I stayed here. When we moved back to Missouri, I was searching for a church 
to take my kids to. And um, there were a lot of families that were from the church in Carthage that I trusted so much in high school that now attended Christ Church. And so that's how we came to start attending here. So I've actually been a recipient of a Right Here, Right Now gift. Um, my boss at the time approached me and said, hey, I know that you're struggling with this. And what had happened was my son got a tooth knocked out during a soccer game. And he knew I was a single mom raising two kids by myself on one income. And so he said, I put this request in and the church wants to help. And so he was able to have that conversation with me and not just give me the gift of money, but also let me know that people were in my corner. So accepting a financial gift is actually really hard for me because I was so used to being an independent person and not having to rely on anyone because in the past, the people that I did rely on let me down. Um, so it was really hard to accept a gift and understand that there were no strings attached to it. My life has changed so much since I received that Right Here, Right Now gift. And actually, a little over a year ago, I was approached to interview for a position on the Right Here, Right Now team. And I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't that interested in it at first. But the more I learned about the position, though, the more I loved it because it was part of a community, which is what we need to be. But it was also God showing me how I went through the things in my life to get where I am now. Right Here, Right Now is a way for our church to show Jesus' love within our church and to our community. And so every week we ask our members to bring a dollar per person in their family above and beyond their tithe. And every week we gather those dollars and we gather the requests and we pray and discern how to spend those dollars. I would encourage anyone to give to Right Here, Right Now because those dollars, when you gather them all together, do amazing things that you couldn't do alone. So it just shows that communities need it even in giving. So I personally have seen what these dollars do and they change people's lives. We are so grateful for the generosity that our church has displayed. And even more than that, the way in which our God has used that generosity to change people's lives over the last 10 years. And the truth is, if you wanna to continue to bring a dollar for everyone in your family every week so that we can continue to meet those needs, please do. But more importantly, even than that, is that we want to know who it is in your life, whether it's in uh, your family or neighborhood or workplace, someone you know who's just struggling and they could just use a blessing, whether that's mowing their lawn or fixing their car or paying a house bill. We want to know because we want to be the church in the world, changing it for the kingdom of God. Because the truth is, God's finished work. What that means for us is that it just begins. And so we need to begin to join him in it as we see those opportunities arise and make themselves available. So you guys are dismissed to go because our work is not done yet. Have a great week.